Well, that was the Russian dance from Petrushka by Igor Stravinsky, played in its duet version by my guests tonight, Katya Apekasheva and Charles Owen. And these two guys fascinate me because they come from totally different directions, like a diminuendo sign in music where you start at two points and then they gradually come together because Katya grew up in Russia, in Moscow, and Charles in England in various places. And then they now teach at the same institution and they play two pianos together and they run a festival together, all of which we'll hear about later. But it's fascinating that they've started from two other points. And I think it's probably Russian music that, or a Russian influence that brought them together. Let's find out. Charles, I think you were born in Cambridge. Uh, yes, that's right. In 1971, We're going to be you celebrating. To that. We won't ask Katia, uh, Katia which year she was. <laughs> no, no need. <laughs> um, yes, born in Cambridge. Uh, Dad was studying at the university, studying theology at the time. And um, I grew up in a very idyllic setting. And every morning, um, mum would take me in my pram across King's Parade and I would go into the King's College Chapel and listen to the choir as a small baby. Um, and so that was, I started with very, very high standards of music, albeit choral and organ music in my, in my tiny ears. So that was the beginning, yes. And you weren't tempted to become a choir boy or your father wasn't tempted to make you into a choir boy? Uh, not really. I mean, I sang a little bit. I had an OK voice and actually mum wanted me to audition as a chorister. But it was me who didn't want to leave home at the age of whatever it is, eight or nine, that they have to go. So I, I, I vetoed that. I think you made a wise decision. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so did you start piano lessons in Cambridge and how did that happen? Uh, no, no piano lessons started until later. We, we moved um, to a small town in Hampshire after that. I should, at that point, my father was already a vicar in the Church of England or a curate. And um, I learned piano lessons. I had, well, I had my lessons with the local church organist um, who seemed terribly grown up to me. He was probably only about 19. Oh. Um, and he was very, very strict in the lessons. And the, the two things I remember most clearly about them was um, that every single lesson, we had to walk down an unmade road full of puddles in the dark. Um, the lessons were 50p each. <laughs> and um, the other thing I also clearly can visualise is that next to his immaculate upright piano every Easter, he was a beloved only child and he had about 30 Easter eggs piled high in their beautiful presentation cases. So it was very hard to concentrate on the actual lesson <laughs> playing the piano as a child with all that chocolate next to the piano. So, And he didn't use them as treats to encourage you? Absolutely not. I was never offered a single piece of chocolate. So it was it was a difficult beginning. Um, and I threatened, I said to mum, I hate these lessons. And she said, well, I'm afraid you're going to have to pay back each 50p that we've paid for the lessons. And so my little brain worked out how much that would be. And I decided to carry on. <laughs> how long with were you with the Easter egg gentleman? Um, maybe three or four years um, and then life took a dramatic uh, change. Um, a wonderful lady called Anne Butterworth, who is st still very much with us in her late 80s, lives in Farnham. She was a church parishioner and she had studied the piano at the Royal College during the Second World War. And she picked me out, took me on, and got me scholarships for, first of all, Wells Cathedral School. And then I moved on to the Yehudi Menuhin School in 1985. Um, so again, church connections from the beginning for me. Ravi, yeah. did you have any connection with a guy that I knew from Farnham called Alan Fluck, who ran a group called Youth and Music. They used to put on cushion concerts in the National Gallery for children. And he was a great pal of Benjamin Britten. And in fact, he was the one who commissioned uh, Noah's Flood. And I, I, had. Well. I, I wish I had, but sadly not. But funny you should mention Noah's Flood because um, as a hopeless violinist, I would played in a school orchestra at the age of about 10 or 11 when they did Noah's Flood. And that first contact with Britain was unforgettable. Um, I'll never, never forget it. It was amazing. I hadn't realised that we had violin in common. I'm the most appalling violinist on the planet, but it was my second study. 
<laughs> yeah, well, when I auditioned at the menu in school, I played the piano and been accepted. And then they said, I think we better hear your violin as well. And I kind of groaned because I hated it so much. Um, and I couldn't even tune it. So the head of music tuned it and I played about a line of a Handel Sonata, um, the one in F major for anyone interested. And they said, actually, I think we've heard enough of that now. Well, there's um, another extraordinary coincidence because it was the Handel F major Sonata that I opened my recital <laughs> at the conservatorium with my recital. I mean, it was my first year exam and um, I was given the admonition to go home and practice long, slow notes and listen to the sound I made. And if it didn't improve, to give up. And I, I didn't learn the violin from that day to this. I love it, Piers. That's so great that we have that connection. I never knew that. Well, um, and the irony is we've then ended up playing with some of the greatest violinists in the world. So there That's you true. go. <laughs> <laughs> and I do feel, funnily enough, that I do have an understanding of the violin. And I went through a funny synesthesia sort of experience where often when I was thinking through piano pieces, I would finger them in my head, but I'd find myself using violin fingering in my left hand while I was thinking through these piano pieces. So very, I always felt that it must be something to do with feeling the intervals in the melodies or something like that, because you feel them on a stringed instrument in a way you don't on the piano. And so I don't know what strange thing was happening in my head, but it does still happen. That's absolutely fascinating. Funnily enough, in, in my lessons, I talk endlessly about the, the way, especially if I want someone to feel a bigger interval, I get them to imagine the cello, how the cello has to reach that bit further. Because um, so often, don't pianists let, uh, just go bah, bah, neck, and they just play the interval right. and feel yeah. the tension of the interval. So um, I think that's a great that you had that from an yeah. early age in your own playing. Um, I know that you have chosen a, a specific piece as a memory from childhood, something that maybe when you, when you realized you were really interested in music. Uh, yes, well, so I phoned mum to check on this and um, apparently I was three or four, I think it was, um, and lying around at home, obviously there was the, the vinyl player and there, was a, and there was a volume of, I think it was called The Master Musicians. So there would be text about a composer and then a lovely vinyl record inside. And it just happened to be Beethoven. And I didn't understand everything that was written there, but the record was the Pastoral Symphony. And my clear memories are this record, um, that wonderful uh, pencil drawing of Beethoven in his, I would say maybe late forties, and uh, some handwritten reproduced in this um, document, which was to inspire people to learn about the composer. And I apparently wore that record out of the Pastoral Symphony. Um, absolutely loved it. Um, such a passion. Mine. I just adore that music. Let's hear the opening of it to remind us all. Yes, please.
the opening of the Pastoral Symphony of Beethoven, of course, uh, an early memory for Charles Owen. But we'll continue with him in a few minutes' time. But meantime, speak with Katya Apekasheva. Well, I'm sure I didn't say that correctly, Katya. You tell me. No, perfect. No, really? <laughs> Something like Russian. In, in fact, even the Russian people sometimes not sure where to put the stress. Is so, it a Russian name originally? It's yes, my dad's uh, surname. It it has a Tatar sort of influence because of, you know a lot of Russian culture. That's why you know sort of that's part of my family has Tatar blood. Hence my big round face. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad you have then. <laughs> um, and Katya, your start was possibly quite different from Charles's. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, well, I, I, I was born in, into a family of musicians. I mean, my, my parents are both professional pianists. Um, in fact, they, they met in, while studying in Moscow Conservatoire. Um, none of my grandparents uh, were professional musicians, but uh, my parents met at the conservatoire and, and they both became uh, repetitors. They, they both still work in big opera companies in Moscow and dedicated their lives to working with singers. So my childhood was filled with um, singers coming to our very small flat. Um, it's quite funny, we still, you know, uh, my parents still live in a very small flat in Moscow where, where I grew up which is a small two bedroom, typical communist block flat, which has, well, which used to have two grand pianos in it. Can you believe it? <laughs> so, so it was, there was not much space to move around. Were the grand and, pianos in the same room or? No, <laughs> that wouldn't be possible, Piers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were in two different rooms, but in fact, what is very nice that one of those pianos are now, it lives at my flat in London. It was um, transported. It, 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 it's an old Steinway and actually one of the highlights of lockdown time, if there can be one, was that it, it, uh, it was fully refurbished by wonderful Steinway people. And, and now I have a beautiful renovated Steinway. So it's a oh, bit of story that, there. Was it from and, the 1920s or earlier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 20s. Around there. Yeah. yeah, it has a beautiful tone and, uh, you know, I, and I'm so glad that I've made this decision to, to renovate it. It's a beautiful home piano. <laughs> and, and um, um, yeah, so I was growing up in, in, surrounded by music. I didn't know any different. And uh, I, I think I've kind of always was a bit jealous. I wanted to sing as well, kind of didn't take that path, but um, I think, you know, wh when you spoke about violin and, and the, you know, sort of you, st you and Charles both studied another instrument, I never did, but I think the singing was also kind of important influence uh, of my life. And I still adore opera. That's something I really passionate about. And um, uh, what, what probably some highlights of my sort of childhood would have been uh, playing lots of duets with my parents as I was growing growing up, and we had lots and lots of scores of, uh, you know, things tra transcribed for piano duet, you know, and of course, in that time we didn't have so much other entertainment, you know, like these days, <laughs> you know, and 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 it was something we did regularly, you know, and, and played things like I don't know, Beethoven quartets transcribed for duets or symphonies, and I, I remember playing some Mahler. Mahler symphonies, sight reading Mahler symphonies for duets and we had so many scores you know and it was so lovely it's one of my best memories of my childhood. What a fantastic start for a musician and for a pianist again to have the vocal thing because every other instrument strives to sing like a like a real singer doesn't it and yeah. um, and to have that background with orchestral works and with opera just innately in you. Did you have any siblings as well, or did you have all this to, just to yourself? Uh, I have a sister who also studied music, but ended up being a, a lawyer and a life coach. Actually, she lives in London now as well. That's nice that she's here too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, very yeah. nice indeed. I wanted to talk to you afterwards uh, about the Ganesan School, 
But um, shall we hear your first choice of music and, and you can tell us why that piece is so important to you? Well, I, it's just one of my earliest memories of something that kind of, you know, something that stayed in my memory that when I look back and I, I don't think I was as young as three, Charles, I'm very impressed. You have memories. <laughs> my memory is not as good, but I think I probably was maybe seven or eight or something like that. And I remember listening to music was also another thing which was part of, we had so many vinyl records, you know, we listened a lot to Bach cantatas and I remember things like that. And then I remember my dad, um, uh, was particularly passionate about this record of Brahms' second piano concerto, and, and we had the recording of Istomen with Ormandy. And I still remember the, the cover of this record was a picture of, I think it was Alps, it must have been, this uh, magnificent landscape of mountains. And, and uh, I remember my dad telling me, and I think that was when we listened to Slow Movement, about sort of the, sort of the power of nature, the majestic character of the music the sort of the space the air and I still remember these images and I remember it was completely magical and of course I still adore Brahms and, and second piano concerto ironically I never played this I only played first concerto so <laughs> one day hopefully still can do it you know but it, it's definitely one of my favorite concertos and that slow movement is very special Let's hear a little bit of it. We'll just have time to hear the opening few pages, but and that ineffable cello solo as well.
Well, that was the glorious first part of the slow movement of Brahms's second piano concerto in B flat, opus 83, played by Eugene Istoman with uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra, conducted by Eugene Ormandy. Um, Charles, we'll come back to you for the time being, continue with your young studies. And you mentioned your audition at the Yehudi Menuhin School in Cobham in Surrey. Um, which year would that have been? And, and set the scene for us. Tell us about that. I'm always fascinated by the Menuhin School. Oh, well, we can talk about it quite a lot because also that's where Katya and I, well, where I first caught a glimpse of her. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the audition was in the summer of 1985 and um, I'd been at Wales Cathedral School and I'd got a lot from that experience, but I wanted to be closer to home. My family were in Hampshire and I hadn't quite worked out. So they arranged an audition for me at the last moment um, in the summer term and they said you know we are totally full but we're going to find space for one extra bed for your son so mum, mum and dad were very happy about that um i remember that mum had just given birth to my youngest sister and she was whilst i was feeding her next door whilst i was doing the audition in the recital room um i just i loved that school i know that People had very different experiences there. But, you know, again, listening to Katia describe contact with great singers and the orchestral repertoire, I think what's influenced me more than anything um, as a youngster was the sound of string playing, glorious string playing, and you know, listening to wonderful quartets, quintets, etc. Um, one of my earliest memories from the menu in school was listening to the two Brahms sextets. You know, when you see the sixth formers and you're 13 or 14, they seem like so growing up um, playing this absolutely glorious music um, actually talking of Brahms I was also obsessed by the second piano concerto but I remember the cover had a very frightening picture of birds on it so I didn't used to listen to it so often um, but that's a sidetrack um, uh, so I think you know and then menu and coming down to the school to conduct and, and coach us and I remember playing the Brahms G major the violin piano sonata with a, a student at school and menu and giving tips and apparently he didn't like the piano very much which is sort of interesting because he had two pianists younger pianist sisters um the pianist brother-in-law louis kentner who also taught um he gave me many many lessons at the menu in school um i just love the fact it was so tiny there were, there were only 49 of us at that time from the age of 10 to 18 and it was like a large international family um, it may have been a tiny bit bohemian on some elements. Um, there are maybe some regrets about the education I could have done with certain more of certain subjects and less of others. But overall, it fired my passion for music. And, and I think that that fire is essential for anyone embarking upon the kind of lives that the three of us lead or any other colleagues on any instrument. You've got to have that fire to, to sustain you through the decades, um, especially, uh, i loathe to mention the current period, but you know, particularly at a time like this when we are um, for all forcibly removed from the stage, um, there has to be an, an in intrinsic love of music. And that for me was nurtured that flame at the menu in school. Um, I forgot to mention there was also a lot of fun to be had, um, lots of tricks. Um, and I was a bit of a ringleader, I have to admit. Um, and we had a school reunion a few years ago and the cook came up to me and she said, you know, Charles, you were the naughtiest child in the history of the school. So I'm gonna just <laughs> leave you with that. There's an accolade. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to share one or two of your tricks with us in that case, if they were that impressive. Oh, um, cutting matron's dress while she was wearing it, um, and uh, launching launching water bombs on the classroom from above whilst the French teacher was trying to teach. That sort of thing. Very innocent. Oh, I forgot to add, um, putting coffee granules into the soup seconds before people were about to try the soup and then watching their faces in the dining room as they couldn't quite work out what the mystery ingredient was that evening. <laughs> that sounds very naughty indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Has, that did, you get, did you get rid of all those tendencies in those early years or do they still crop up from time to time? 
Uh, they, they do crop up occasionally. Um, that's partly one of the reasons why I love uh, Francis Poulenc's music so much, because mm -hmm. I, and his na naughtiness comes out as well as his lyricism and his profundity, and that sparkling quality comes out. Well, that's interesting you mentioned Poulenc, because I think your next choice of music is in fact Poulenc. Um, it, he, stories of him fascinate me. I remember Felix Abrahamian, who used to be president of Putney Music, of course, yes. um, saying that because they were great mates. And um, I think Poulenc's main objection to other pianists playing was that they used too little pedal. <laughs> he liked things bathed in a halo of pedal. <laughs> exactly. What I adore about Poulenc is that there's very little middle ground. You know, it's either absolutely gorgeous, soaked in pedal. You know, there's markings such as in the Elegy for two pianos where he says, you know, you can never use enough pedal. It's just, just sort of, it is, it breaks all the rules of piano teachers. And then you've got on the opposite end of the dial, très sec, extremely caustic, biting wit, totally dry. He doesn't want any pedal. So these two extremes with Poulenc, do you agree, Piers, it has that quality? Absolutely, fantastic. And the, another story from Felix was that he was very shy actually on stage and there was an occasion in London when he was accompanying Pierre Bernac, the great singer, and he snuck on stage at the last minute sort of thing when the lights were going down. Um, maybe didn't want to be seen to be Poulenc or something, I don't know, but man of contradictions, but wonderful music. And uh, we're going to hear some. Why are we going to hear this piece? Well, when, when we got the brief for this chat, you, uh, one of the questions was, you know, what was your professional debut on, on disc? Um, the first solo record was actually Janacek. I recorded the major piano works of Janacek um, uh, nearly 20 years ago. Um, I could have chosen a track from that, but this second record got even more attention and was an editor's choice in the gramophone. And I think it kind of brought me into the public consciousness in my very early 30s. Um, and not that many people play this work. This is the Tarantella from uh, Napoli, which is full of high spirits and sunshine and joy. And quite frankly, in the middle of this dark winter, I thought I'm not going to choose some dark Janacek. I'm going to, let's remember the bright sunlight of Southern Italy through this Napoli, this Tarantella.
That was Charles Owen playing the Caprice Italienne from Poulenc's little known suite, Napoli. Um, but we're going to talk further now with Katia. And I'd love to hear, Katia, about how you came to be at the Gnesson uh, School and, you know, what happened. We've had this wonderful domestic setup with your musician parents, which sounds idyllic. And um, what decided you to concentrate on solo piano and to, to get into that school? Was it a terrible audition to do? I can't really sort of remember very much. I mean, my parents had some friends and, and they sort of recommended the school for me. I think sort of I was very musical from very early age and, and um, of course for my parents being professional musicians it was quite natural you know for um, to, to think of you know putting me through the musical education so through through a friend we got introduced to my first piano teacher who was an incredible teacher who I will forever she, she, remember she passed away a few years ago she was in her 90s and and she uh, i think was probably one of the best teachers for young um children uh, was she, was, uh, she was called ada traub and and she through her a lot of uh, very established pianists started with her like um, one of her star pupils was lilia zilberstein and, and um she had she was a wonderful lady. And I think I, I remember actually when I came to see her first time, I actually maybe some one of my earliest memories because I think I was still four and maybe I was four and a half. And, 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 and I remember that she just asked me to sing some songs. And, and, and then apparently she said that I was very clearly very musical and it was the right thing, you know, kind of that I was very natural. And she actually later told me that when we started, when she put my hands on the piano, it's just interesting. I remember her saying that, that my hand was just so natural on the piano and, and, and sort of she didn't have to kind of, well, I'm sure she had to teach me a lot, but you know, sort of it, the, the technically the positioning was so easy for me. Like I never had any kind of issues with that. And, and she was a very, she, she had this combination of being extremely kind and, and, uh, inspiring at the same time strict and and one of my earliest memories is remember I was quite a lazy kid I mean I, I loved music I was musical but I didn't like practicing and she gave me some pieces uh, to prepare for a lesson and I remember it was from the Prokofiev's children's album I don't know if you know that there are wonderful pieces and, and this was one of the first pieces that I learned. And I remember that uh, there was one piece and I think I just didn't practice it. And when I came to a lesson, she listened to other pieces and she said, oh, how about this one? And I said, yeah, yeah, I practiced it. And I just lied to her because I just didn't want to accept, tell her that I didn't. So she made me play it and she said, well, okay. And then I remember, of course, I couldn't, sort of play it properly because I didn't practice but she made me she just didn't stop so basically I remember this feeling of humiliation of playing to the end it was silence and and, and tears were pouring on <laughs> my face and actually it was kind of it just one of those memories just stayed with me and she kind of didn't say anything because I I was so ashamed myself you know that it didn't need any <laughs> extra work so and 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 and, and she was extremely kind and gentle and, and at the same time, as I say, kind of I, her pupils hated upset, upsetting her. Um, you just knew when you were doing something wrong or you were not prepared enough. And uh, so she was my, my very first teacher. And then it, it's kind of a little complicated story because she became unwell at a at, at, at certain point when I was probably about eight or well, probably nine years old and then she stopped working for a couple of years and that was the time when I met Anna Cantor my second teacher in the school and she kind of passed me on to her and, and um, who is who was another of course fantastic teacher who influenced me greatly and I stayed with her and um and, 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 and it's a funny ending story as well because at the end of my studies at the Gnesin school Anna Cantor who 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 is a teacher, who was a teacher of Evgeny Kisin, of course, a very famous, prominent pianist. She, um, she was very close with the 
family of Yevgeny and she they, they left for USA and um, she, she came together with Yevgeny's family and it was in the middle of my uh, studies. Uh, it was my last year at the school and then I actually finished with at the trial, I finished my studies. So I kind of was a circle. So I, my, my last sort of six months were with other Traub and, and, you know, she kind of- Fascinating that yes, you came yes. back and completed. And at that school, did it involve normal classes as well? And, and what other sort of musical subjects? Did you have to study harmony and counterpoint, all that sort of stuff and oral work as well? Yes. Yes, I mean a little bit can echo Charles's words. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know enough about many schools' education, but I have to say that Nessin School is most in, incredible in terms of musical subjects, and I think we've had most amazing teachers of sort of harmony and and musical history and all, all that kind of thing. And 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 I have to say, sort of slightly more mixed bag when it came to other subjects. <laughs> so my general knowledge sometimes is a little bit questionable i sometimes you because my you know my husband is a barrister and, and we, sometimes we watch some quizzes on tv i'm afraid i have no answers to anything and he's always <laughs> laughing at me my my lack of i don't want to offend anybody but it was definitely music central the, the, you know the school and and of course that was kind of amazing and like charles said i mean it's musically it felt very sort of motivated, inspired, especially by certain teachers. And we had a lot of opportunities and actually we had to play a lot of sort of public performances. We had to participate in a lot of, and we had some grueling exams. And I still remember sort of the, the exam, technical exams in the middle of the year with scales. And I still remember that towards the end of my studies, everybody had to play Cherny Takata. I don't know if you know this piece. Yes, but, I do, actually. And in fact, I think Schumann must have known that Takata as well, yeah, yeah. because it's just like a precursor to his it's one. Very, exactly. And, and I just remember it was full of like thirds and, and really difficult piece. And it was like the last piece of the technical exams in school kind of that you had wow. to play. Everybody had to play it. Somehow I remember it. Yeah. And, you know, we often refer to the Russian method of piano playing, but nobody really specifies what it is. Do you, can you say anything about it? I presume at that school, there were many different methods according to the teacher you were with. Um, was there a, a particular emphasis on a singing tone or, you know, things like that technical exam? Yeah, typical yeah I mean, I'm a little bit sort of, you know, I, I don't always like this kind of labeling of being product of Russian school because it's so, it, it you know, sort of, it just it sounds a bit simplistic and and, and you know and uh, sort of if you think of greatest pianists uh, that Russia produced they, they're so varied as well you know if you think of you know Gilles and Richter is such different playing and and but probably yeah I mean in in terms of something in it that I could say there was a style of teaching or, or something that was emphasized yes definitely the tone the singing tone the depth of sound uh, the richness of sound, which actually sometimes I miss sometimes when, when I listen to other pianists and, and actually these days, the, the, the real sort of richness and variety of tone that can be and the sort of very deep touch, yes. And, and, and kind of feeling that, I think that one of the best thing I was taught kind of to really relax into piano, that it's your friend that you sort of, uh, I, I, yes, I mean, like anything, when you label something a school of a type, it has its pluses and minuses. It has limitations as well. So, I mean, Russian way of teaching and repertoire was quite um, sort of particular. It didn't sort of say we didn't cover a lot of... We did, of course, play Bach and, and you know, sort of the, the classical repertoire, but it was taught in a particular style. We all use this Mugellini edition, if, if you know of such. Uh, with sort of, which actually probably for kids was quite good because it gave a lot of comments how you should play, sort of characterizing things and, and putting articulations and, and sorry to be so, maybe I'm too detailed, but you know, it's, uh, which of course Bach didn't really write and, and later on in life, I, I, you know, you start to really question why, why do you have to, there was certain tradition of how Bach had to be played or 
sort of certain repertoire was avoided a little bit because it was just not a sort of traditionally played very much, you know, and definitely not much contemporary repertoire in, in sort of, well, at least when I was studying. I think I'm sure probably things changed since then. And and I never studied in conservatoire because I left after I fin graduated from the school, so I wouldn't know enough about that. That's fascinating. And I, I know <laughs> from other Russian pianists that the, the piece we heard from Charles, the Poulenc, would definitely not have been, you know, encouraged in no. Russia. <laughs> it would have been lightweight or something. Um, so it's interesting, the first disc that you made was Grieg, in fact, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Different culture. I, well, actually, finally, just a little thing. What I remember from the school is, is um, that uh, the one of the pieces that everybody loved playing of course was the Greek piano concerto and I remember the sort of kids because people played very difficult repertoire very early on and I think I remember everybody was jealous and saying to each other have oh I haven't yet played the Greek concerto in the first movement and and I remember I was quite jealous because I wasn't given it and sort of people already 11 years old they were playing this first movement you know sort of 11 12 years old and I, I remember sort of being kind of jealous and that amazing cadenza you know and and, and this big romantic piece so <laughs> just have the memory of that but I mean I I was very much inspired I remember that the one of the my favorite records was Gillel's recording of lyric pieces I, I really think it was it, I think he recorded it quite late if I remember correctly it was actually his late recording and it, it was the most moving you know just this simple pieces that often kids play, you know, or it's kind of amateurs, you know, that, that it was, they were so profound and so moving. And, and, and I, I love Greek. I mean, I've, I've all, I actually think he's quite original and he's recognizable. His music is very unique, you know, that, you know, his language is unlike other composers. Mm. And uh, also I played at his house in Trollhagen. And that was also inspiration for him because I absolutely adore Norway, the fjords, the nature, and, and there is something so pure about the music that I was completely in love with it. And, and yeah, I was very happy to record it. Let's hear something from you from that first recording.
Well, that was our guest today, Katya Apekisheva, playing Grieg's Lonely Wanderer from the lyric pieces after being inspired by the great Gilels, um, whose recording of those lyric pieces surprised people at the time. They were amazed that someone of his stature was bothering to record little pieces by Grieg, but how wonderfully he did it and how wonderfully Katia does them. Um, we shall return to Charles now. You hinted before that the Menuhin School was where you first spotted Katia. Was that across a crowded room? <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, actually, it was. Um, can, can, you, can you picture the uh, the music library? It used to be called Piers. It looked like a kind of boat, beautifully designed with sort of wood. This is before the menu in school had its new concert hall, and so many of the world's greatest musicians in the last fifty years have been and played there and given master classes and concerts. And in 1987, so this was a couple of years after I joined the school, I forget which month, but a group from the Ganesian School in Moscow came to play for us. They were touring, Katya will tell us more in a moment, they were touring um, as maybe kind of a, to show the West what their standard was, and also as a sort of beginning of Glasnost this time, and traveling and I remember very clearly we were all blown away by the standard of playing and there was this one very sweet adorable girl and I remember my teacher at the time Seta Taniel saying to me oh she is so gifted and then of course it turned out all those years later Katya and I met at the Royal College about five or six years after that or a bit more maybe and it had been Katya all those years ago and the other thing about it, I was blown out of the water by the playing. And of course, I remember hearing, you know, the young Yevgeny Kisin in this small room, just couldn't believe the sound that was possible to produce on the piano. Um, but afterwards, there was a reception and we couldn't speak to each other because, you know, they couldn't speak English and I couldn't, none of us could speak Russian. And it was actually that that really inspired me to start learning the Russian language myself. And then I also started to work more closely with um, Irina Zaritskaya, who was a very, very great Russian Ukrainian pianist who Menuhin had invited to the school together with her violinist husband, Felix Andreevsky. So the visit of the Ganesian school, we heard maybe 10 or 11, not just on piano, there were all sorts of instruments played. Um, and then the contact with Irina, hearing her Chopin and, and Rachmaninoff and Scriabin playing also in that same hall at the menu in school. That was for me the beginning of my curiosity, really awakening. I think there was also something in childhood about, you know, Russia as the scary country, you know, pictures of the um, Red Square and the missiles and what have you and the parades. So I was fascinated by the composers, the image of Russia on the television, um, is what I'm talking in the late 70s and 80s. Um, and then this extraordinary visit when I first heard Katia play. But of course, as I said, we didn't meet until a number of years afterwards at the Royal College. And you studied, you said, with Seta Taniel, who's Armenian, of course, lives in London, but studied in Vienna herself. So she would have had quite a lot of that classical schooling, I imagine, although she went on to record things like Shavenka and Moshkovsky, all sorts of fascinating, colourful playing. And... Um, yeah, she's an incredibly virtuoso player um, and she just had this amazing ease at the piano and a kind of brilliance and, and again lots of insights into uh, the repertoire she had studied in, I mean her repertoire is voluminous and um, the repertoire she studied in um, Vienna I think was a big part of her own uh, training. But then Irina Zaretskaya, I remember her so well, she tied for first place in which competition? Was it the Chopin competition in Warsaw? The Chopin, the Chopin competition, I remember it was in 19, her telling us in 1960, she was second prize to Polini, as she always pointed out, by one point. <laughs> 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 Again, that, that kind of thing is very important for Russians. And I mean, there's another thing about performing in Russia, as I'm sure you know, I don't know if it's the same right now, but it certainly was when I was there. Before you go out to play, the announcer lists the prizes you've won, which is a most, it's quite anachronistic and it's sort of weird for Western audience to even consider it. But um, anyway, going back to Irina, I'd love to talk about her, and I know Katya will too, because that's through her basically that we met properly as young adults. Um, she had this position at the Royal College of Music and she had this fantastic class of students and uh, just the sound she got out of the piano, her ability to explain every single technical 
uh, approach to every possible sound, practice techniques, her love of the music and her incredibly warm personality. Um, I wouldn't describe her as a sort of great intellectual when it came to analysing works, but she, I, I wouldn't be playing professionally today without those five years of study with her. Um, and that was through her. Again, I met many others. I improved my Russian, spoken Russian, and she taught me in Russian for at least three or four years. So, yeah, well, I'm a bit rusty now. All... But thank you. It's still all there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's extraordinary, Charles. And, and I would love to come back to Katya about that in a minute, but we'll first hear your next selection, which is something you've just recorded uh, during lockdown, in fact. I heard you do it on Facebook as a, a sort of practice run, but you've got the real thing now, more or less. And um, it's it's a gorgeous piano piece, I think. Just such a delicious piece. You tell us about it. Um, well, when lockdown came, this will take a while to say, but I will just quickly tell you. I had been dreaming of recording Annie de Pelotonage by List, the Swiss book. Um, and I grew up listening to Brendel's recording, which I adored in my teens. And somehow being stuck at home, admittedly in a, the first lockdown in that beautiful spring, I thought I need to play music, which is about travel, which is about landscape and beauty. I just wanted to be surrounded by beauty. And I only played Chopin, Schumann and Liszt for most of last year. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided this is the time to record it. You've got the practice time. And I worked intensively on Anne de Pernage and then performed it a few times. Um, and this particular piece, or bald in source, um, by a spring, it's inspired by words of uh, Schiller, where he describes the water bubbling out of the, the, uh, the sort of alpine streams and how young nature starts to play. Um, and I can also hear the spirit of Schubert in this piece and Liszt adored Schubert and of course all the transcriptions um, of his songs that Liszt wrote, such a wonderful tribute. Uh, so it made me think of Switzerland, a country I love, the mountains, coming back to mountains. And it just, really fed my soul, this repertoire, through those first months of lockdown. Um, and then I recorded it at the Menuhin School, where else? Um, on a beautiful new Steinway, which I chose together with Ashley Wass, who's the new director of music at the Menuhin School, and of course, a fabulous pianist himself.
that was the Obordian source by Liszt, played by Charles Owen on the new Steinway he helped select at the Yehudi Menuhin School and coming out on a new disc later this year. Uh, Katia, uh, you know that you spent time in Jerusalem. And that was, I think, with Irina Zaretskaya, Charles's teacher as well. No, actually, it was a, uh, Irina, another Irina, Irina Berkovic, who, who uh, actually was a, well, she, she's a friend of my parents. She studied at the conservatory at the same time and was a, uh, she won a third prize in Leipzig Bach competition uh, many years ago. And, and actually, she's kind of a Bach expert, so quite a different type of, talking of Russian school of playing, a very different approach. And, and she was a very... Um, She's quite a sort of scary teacher, very, very intimidating, very intellectual. And, and um, I mean, she, she gave me quite a different side, you know, to, to my approach to music. And she was quite a sort of brutal teacher in many ways, but definitely fascinating person. And, and, and um, as I say, very, very different to Irina Zaritskaya. And, and um, then I'm met Irina and, and yeah, I, I, I got scholarship to study in Royal College of Music. Otherwise I, probably wouldn't, wouldn't be able to afford it <laughs> to say, as an overseas student. And um, we just became very close straight away. And Irina was a very special person and she, I think all her students felt like family, you know, you were sort of felt like part of the family. She was such a warm, incredibly warm person so caring about her students and 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 um, um yeah like charles said i mean she was very special she was very much sort of i would say specializing probably in romantic repertoire it was her strength and of course in particular chopin because you know that was her love you know and 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 you know she was so great with her attention to detail and and to, like Charles said, I mean, I, I just remember how tireless, tirelessly she was, if she felt you didn't have the right fingering for something or something was a bit awkward, she could spend, you know, really long time. I still remember her giving me fingerings for the Chopin second sonata for the last movement because, you know, with the these notorious passages and, and, and that was the piece that she played all her life so she you know and actually her hands were quite similar to mine because I you know as you know with fingerings I think it people have such different hands and think you know shaped hands and sort of in fact actually interestingly with Charles Charles don't we have quite different sometimes you know with fingerings we sort of check each other's finger oh really can you play with this fingering I I how do you manage it? It's quite funny. So, no, we sometimes notice sort of things like that. But I don't know, like with Irina, I found like, a, a, and she didn't cheat Charles. She found most amazing solutions to difficult passages. She was great at uh, untangling, you know, sort of and creating comfortable patterns. And, and she was just amazing. And she was, she never was sort of tired, you know, of doing that. Because I mean, as a teacher myself, sometimes I see my, you know, students and I just think, oh my God, <laughs> am I really, can I start this now? <laughs> Go into all this fingering. And of course, particularly, you know, on when we teach online, it's it's just, that is really is <laughs> even more challenging. We'll, we'll yeah. Talk about that a, a bit in a minute. I just was remembering talking to Irina about her arrival in Jerusalem. Did you meet her there or in London? I actually did finally meet her. Well, we met in Tel Aviv, to be more precise, through, really? through a friend yes. who actually introduced us. And 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 and, and Irina was. I mean, she was such a. She loved life. And and I remember immediately we, we had some very delicious meal. And 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 she knew some restaurant. And and, and just remember sort of the the she and her husband were such foodies, you know. And and um, yeah. well, apparently when they arrived in Israel as refugees. Um, they were going to be sent <clears throat> to some little village or something. And apparently she sat down and refused to move for three days um, because she said, if we go to that village, we'll end up doing nothing. And she insisted that they go to Tel Aviv, I think. And of course she ended up, and Felix too, teaching uh, wonderful musicians there. But it was her strength of character that got them in that position because she sat down and didn't move for three days. <laughs> 
Wow, that, I, I didn't know that story, but I can imagine because I think Irina was so gentle and warm, but I, I, she she was very strong inside. Yeah, I think, you know, if she sort of set her mind on something, for sure, you know. You've in introduced an interesting topic about teaching during lockdown too. And I'm sure people would be interested to know about teaching on Zoom. I remember talking to Charles actually about it uh, early on and he was agreeing with me that he wouldn't want to teach people he didn't know uh, on Zoom, that it was helpful with your own students to a certain degree, but you sometimes want them to use more pedal and it turns out they've got the pedal on anyway. And there's all sorts of knacks. And I imagine as time has gone on that you've found ways of coping because both of you are teachers at the Guildhall School of Music. And so you would have had to do a lot of coaching online in the recent yes. times. Yes, it's it's very challenging, but I think like with everything, you just get used to it. You know, I, I don't want to get used to it, but, but we have to, you know. And, 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 and funnily enough, I actually had to teach some uh, people in, in, in the summer. I was supposed to be on a summer course which of course didn't happen in, in for real. And, and then they asked me if I would be willing to teach a couple of people on Zoom and I did. And and uh, so so it's not my students, not the people I knew. And um, well, I, I guess you just try to, you know, to do the best you can, you know? I mean, the problem is when the, so often the sound is just really bad and you can't judge, like you said, you know, sometimes I tell my pupils, why can't you play pianissimo? Why is it so loud? And then they tell me I can't physically play any quieter. And you realize, well, probably the camera is too close and, you know, or they play on the really bad piano often, you know, and, and uh, uh, yeah, you, you just have to get used to it a little bit and kind of do your best. And yeah. often, I mean, often I, I, I found, I, I, Charles is not such a big fan of that, but I ask my students to record themselves sometimes because it's just, and then give them comments or at least talk afterwards because at least the sound is bear, more bearable because if they record, they will not send you something that, you know, you wouldn't be able to hear properly, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I just add a few words there on the teaching because it is it, it's dominating our lives and uh, normally I so I teach one day a week at the Guildhall I do a seven hours uh, three hours break four hours um, with online teaching I can only manage max two hours per day and I will never go above that uh, because it is absolutely exhausting I'm sure you've both found the same um, doing this online teaching. You have to constantly refer to, you know, which bar, which beat, you know, what finger are you, are you changing fingers on that in that middle voice, whatever, whatever it is. So that can be very exhausting. Um, but as the months have rolled by, and of course we were in person for last, the autumn term, um, I think I've got more skill at it. Um, um, and I have to say during lockdown, I like to do my practice for a few hours and then I put uh, someone comes on the screen at about 3 p.m. And it can be really rather nice to see a face at the end of the day yeah. and, and to work with them. Um, but uh, it's true, Piers, I did say to you, I didn't want to ever work with someone I'd never met. But of course, real life has taken over. And I've actually done a few masterclasses and have a few more for some of the Cardiff and Birmingham. And there you have to just meet a, a stranger online and be, and they have to meet you and you have to be as friendly as possible. Um, I think in Birmingham, they had me on some huge screen. It was rather like the Wizard of Oz, you know, remember when he appears at the end. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm talking about beautiful sound, though, we'll go back to Katia's next choice of music, which is, I think, from her uh, solo disc of Forêt, another culture again, um, well, in keeping with Charles's Poulain, perhaps, but uh, have you had a love affair with Forêt? Uh, well, I, it's actually impromptu CD, so there are a selection of Scrab in Forêt ah. and, and uh, and Chopin, so that that's the underlying theme. But yes, actually, with Foray, I mean, I sort of got to know his music a bit, sort of late in my life, I guess. You know, it wasn't so hugely familiar. Of course, I've heard pieces here and there, but I didn't know it as well. And, and actually, Charles's recordings inspired me. Charles's and Kathy's thoughts, you know, because I, Charles recorded Nocturnes and Barcarolles, right? And and and. Um, and Kathy, I think, recorded most of foreign music and, and, and Kathy oh. Stott. And, and, and uh, I was blown away by it and, and sort of wanted to try myself. And, and I really, I love foreign. I mean, uh, this impromptu that I've 
chosen in particular. I mean, it has such, I mean, I've just such haunting, rich harmonies, like they're so unusual, very sensuous, very spicy. And, and, and I mean, these are very tricky technically. Foray has so, mm. his writing for piano is so, <laughs> you know, challenging, you know, and, and even like with, impromptuous or like when Charles when you did nocturnes I mean they might be called nocturnes but they most of them would have some kind of virtuosic part and and uh, so so much voicing you know so so many notes but but absolutely beautiful and and they're really sort of otherworldly a lot of them they really take you somewhere else That was Katya at Pekesheva with Foray's impromptu number one, Opus 25, from the second disc she made. Um, and she and Charles Owen have had parallel lives in so many ways. And that's, that's led to some 
interesting things. Not only they're both teaching at the Guildhall School of Music, they have founded a festival together as well. And please, one of you tell me about that. Well, London Piano Festival, we first dreamt the idea up around 2012. The, it came about because we've played together on and off since the early noughties. Katya invited me to go to Moscow to take part in a festival in the Conservatoire in the Rachmaninoff Hall. Um, and the festival was called Vafrashenya, which is homecoming in Russian, uh, literally returning. And I was a guest there, and, but most of the performers there are people who studied in Moscow, who've then moved abroad and are then returning to Russia each January for this festival, which is run by Roman Mintz, a fantastic violinist, and Dima Bulgakov, oberist. So we played together there and it just clicked. It was amazing. We never set out to be a duo. It just sort of happened very organically. And then another concert came in and then we did something here and there and it just built. And then after a while, people said, you know, you two really work together. You sound really good together. And we had such fun in the rehearsals. Um, there's never any sense of power struggle in the rehearsal. I think the only time she's ever been cross with me was when I managed to go to a BBC broadcast having forgotten all my music at home. <laughs> so... Yeah, exactly. I, th I think any tensions that Charles and I have have nothing to do with music or rehearsing or a a any sort of way. We, if I may, just sorry for for coming in, but I think definitely for me, it's my like most meaningful collaboration for me, probably in my life with Charles, because also we go back so many years, and and we've always loved wor working together, and we always look forward to it, it it sort of makes us more motivated also separately as a individual individually as well we play to each other as well when we're learning new programs and in fact we are i mean charles you don't mind saying we, we are planning a cd recording in the next few months it, it's something that we've been talking about and again th these times are so difficult to i think for solo solo pianist to you know to motivate yourself if you don't have something coming up it's just really hard so we just thought we we well we're due to record anyway, I think. It's been a while. And, and um, it would be a wonderful thing to do together mm -hmm. to keep each other fired up. Yes. yes. And, um, I, I think also in the rehearsals, um, we demand so much of each other and we push each other and we're completely come from the same page. And even if we slightly disagree on something, you know, we always just naturally get to that point. It, it, it just, it's a wonderful... Yeah, but we, don't, we, we actually don't disagree very much. I mean, we sort of always try because I think we completely respect each other's opinion and, and we know it's coming from the right place. We, never take things personally it just never happens and you know you can be completely open and, and actually that's quite rare I think yeah. Piercy would agree it it, it, yeah. it you know played with so many people but to, to have this complete openness when you don't get defensive when you feel comfortable you know other person respects you fully is very rare and, and also that we have to work personalities have to work as well you know mm. and and we've just been so lucky this way we always look forward to practicing together not just concerts that sounds perfect. And it's wonderful that both of you as solo pianists also have a massive repertoire with other people on other instruments. You know, you both have a big chamber music part of your lives, um, which is, is becoming more the thing these days. There are very few people who only have solo careers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and we look for full musicians these days in, in a different way, perhaps from 50 years ago. And yeah. um, and it's wonderful that you both have that sense of things as well. And, and tell us how that collaboration led to King's Place. Well, King's Place, so the architect of King's Place is a very good friend of mine, J uh, Jeremy Dixon, and uh, he's a big piano lover. And I met him in the mid nineties when I was having lessons and coaching with Imogen Cooper, who happened to live two doors up from him. And Imogen, I haven't really had much chance to talk about her. I mean, she's been a big influence on both of us. Um, and even now I still play to her. And before making the List record, I went and played to her and some friends and, you know, and she gave wonderful notes as always. I mean, she's just the most extraordinary lady and musician and her insights are, I think, unparalleled. She's an incredible voice. But so I met Jeremy, I'm getting sidetracked as I often do. And 
Imogen one day phoned up and she said, you know, this is going to be this new concert hall this new in London and our friend Jeremy is designing it. Would you like to come and, tr and try out the pianos on stage? It's not yet open to the public. So to cut a long story short, she and I went there in, I think it was 2008 or something, seven, one of those years. And the hall was amazing, but it was still very, very fresh. And uh, we were trying the pianos on the stage. I remember Leslie Garrett joined us as well, so we could have some vocal uh, sounds as well as piano. And then they started concerts there, and I was asked to play in some of them, and then Katya was asked to play. And, you know, gradually we sort of fell in love with this vibrant contemporary setting. We love the fact that the building is flooded with light. It's very open. There's lots of different things going on. It's not just the concert hall. You've got the art galleries, restaurants, um, the, the light refracted off the canal. It's just a, a beautiful space. But the hall itself is like this sort of secret bubble in the bowels of the building with all this wonderful wood panelling and we just suggested the idea to the CEO Peter Millican I think it was 2012 and it came one year after being at Finney and Collins's festival the Irish pianist it, he runs in New Ross and at that same festival we formed a gang with Kathy Stott who I've obviously known for years she's also ex menuhin and Noriko Ogawa and various others and I think we love the fact that pianists were gathered together at a festival and not competing because so often when pianists meet they're in competitions and it was a joy not to have to go through that and to listen to each other playing solos and together and that inspired us to, to create something at King's Place, this beautiful new hall, this sort of carte blanche. Um, so yeah. the first festival was 2016 I think Katia wasn't it? 2016 yes. 2016. Yeah, uh, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say, just uh, correct me, what was also so nice is the, well, is very nice that the whole area div sort of really trans transformed in last years, hasn't it? Because where I think when King's Place opened, the, the sort of King's Cross area was still relatively sort of unknown to some people. They wouldn't go, you know, all the way to King's Cross for a concert when they go to Wigmore Hall or South Bank or, you know, and, and these days it's the area and they're still, I think, building something. They still haven't been completed, but the whole area of Granary Square and, and the yes. canal, it, it's now, I just remember the feeling one of past festivals that sort of when we look around and we feel so sort of happy and proud that you know that our festival is in, in this very nice spot that you know people like to hang out now and um, which is also important because it's a festival I think that's one of the things that it's a, it's a little bit different from just going to concerts you know in London where there are so many of course and some amazing choices so we were hoping to create more sort of special atmosphere. Mm. Definitely. And there's a sort of camaraderie and different p pianists who have never met each other before often play two pianos. At the heart of every festival, there's a two piano gala on the Saturday evening. And it can, mm. so, th I think the first time we did it, we slightly overambitious. It was described as one of those mammoth 19th century concerts with two intervals that lasted about four hours. Uh, we haven't done well, that, so fear not. Yeah. Uh, but it's, I think what's great is that there, we always have, so we have solo recitals, two pianos, jazz, as spoken word, uh, we've had family concerts um, and an enormous range of artists and repertoire and styles. Um, obviously last year had, the whole thing had to be cancelled but we replaced it with one special evening where Imogen Cooper joined us and the jazz pianist Bill Lawrence joined us. Um, this year we are tentatively re-emerging with a much smaller weekend, not the five days we previously had, um, but there will be some wonderful things there. I can, I can just announce that Kathy Stock will be there and Finney and Collins will be there and other things are very much being discussed at this point. Well, we have, a, we have a also newly commissioned piece. Uh, I mean, that's another th sort of strand. We, we try to commission uh, most of, of the years the new piece. So we have Sally Beamish who, who is writing a rather unusual piece for three people. <laughs> Yeah. So that would be slightly choreographed and, and sort of a little bit, something a little bit different. 
Yes, this is a co-commission with Finney and Collins Festival in Ireland, um, New Ross. Um, and I, I was speaking to Sally Beamish on the phone a couple of days ago, and she had this amazing idea, which she's developed, of uh, a piece inspired by Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, sonnets that were written to, I think she was called The Dark Lady. And so there was Shakespeare, there was a young man, and this mysterious dark lady, and there was a kind of love triangle. So I think it's rather good that we've got Katia and we've got uh, two men. Um, and it was written during the time of plague when um, Shakespeare was sent out of London to escape the plague. Um, so I think that all sorts of fascinating little twists there that Sally's managed to weave in. And obviously we've not heard the work yet. Very excited to hear it. Um, and as Katya mentioned, yes, we have commissioned, and I'd love to just mention, we've commissioned Nico Mooley, um, Jonathan Dove, Elena Langer, uh, all written brand new works for us, um, many of which have been on Radio 3. And we also played Thomas Addis's extraordinary Powder Her Face uh, suite for two pianos, which Tom coached us in and he attended, and I think approved of the performance. Golly, yes. well... Such exciting things, and it's uh, we'll have to bring this conversation to a close, but that's a perfect way to end because it's just extraordinary and wonderful to hear how your two lives have intersected and now produce wonderful new things. You know, it's uh, it's a friendship that has inspired other people and will continue to do so in a major way. So, thank you so much. We'll, we'll end by hearing you both together again, but before that. I just want to ask you, Charles, what are those extraordinary artworks on your wall? Oh, wow. Oh, well, um, they are, let me move. Can you see them a bit better? Yes, yes indeed. They were bought um, this time last year, not last year, I'm losing track, 19. I was in Queensland for the, um, for the Australian Festival of Chamber Music, which of course you directed for so many years, and Katya has also been, um, and had a holiday in North Queensland, and we discovered these beautiful works by Alec Tapotti, who's a Torres Strait Islander. And um, in fact, there's a matching one. Can you see it on the other side? <laughs> and the lamp there, that came from Byron Bay. So Piers, in honor of you, we've got a very Australian um, backdrop. Couldn't be a more perfect way to end. <laughs> Thank you both so, so much. And we look forward now to hearing you play two pianos from your disc of Rachmaninoff. This is from the first suite for two pianos, which I love, and it, which is not actually as well known as the second, but I, I think it works extraordinarily as a two piano work. It, each piano helps bring out the sonority of the other in a most amazing way. And we're going to hear the Barcarolle, aren't we? The first one. Yeah. So thank you both so much. Can't wait to see you in person again soon. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.